Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 24th of June. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Adidang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Korea summons the Japanese ambassador to protest Tokyo's recent re examination of its landmark apology for wartime sex slavery. Seoul also plans to boost international understanding of the issue. An enlisted sergeant who killed five of his fellow soldiers in a shooting spree last weekend has been captured by authorities after a botched suicide attempt. Doctors say the soldier's injuries are not life threatening. Plus, at the World Cup in Brazil, the Netherlands beats Chile 2 0 to finish top of Group B. Chile go through in second. Brazil and Mexico advance to the last 16 with victories in their final Group A games. Our top story this morning. Korea has summoned the Japanese ambassador to lodge a formal complaint over Tokyo's recent review of its landmark apology for its wartime system of sex slavery. Seoul says the re-verification was a purposeful attempt to erode the Kono statement's credibility. Uh, Huang Jie starts us off. With the relationship between Korea and Japan growing increasingly frosty over historical issues, Seoul summoned the Japanese ambassador on Monday. It came in response to Tokyo's announcement last week of its re examination into the Kuno statement. Cho Tae Yong, Korea's vice foreign minister, told Japanese envoy Kuro Pesho it's a historical fact that women were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II, and the whole world recognizes it. The more the Abe administration attempts to dismiss the Kono statement, the more its credibility and international reputation will suffer. Japan will have to know that for sure. The Abe government, while upholding the statement, claimed that Seoul was in close consultation with Japan when the statement was being drawn up. The Kuno statement was issued back in 1993 by then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono. It acknowledged for the first time the forced sexual enslavement of some 200,000 women. In addition to calling in the Japanese ambassador to complain about the move out of Tokyo, the Korean government plans to register historical records regarding the so-called comfort women with UNESCO and bring up the issue during United Nations meetings. Korea's foreign ministry is known to have tentatively concluded that the Japanese review was trying to diminish the testimonies of sexual slavery victims and the apologetic tone of the Kuno statement. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And staying on that story, the Korean government says it will publish a special report as part of its push to raise international awareness of the sex slavery issue in light of Japan's re-examination of its landmark apology. Officials said on Monday that Seoul will publish a white paper on the forced sexual enslavement of some 200,000 women, many of them Korean, by the Japanese military during World War II. The Korean government wants Japan to acknowledge and take responsibility for its past wrongdoings, and Seoul also wants to raise the international community's understanding of this highly emotive issue. And just to reiterate, the issue back in 1993 by then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono, the so-called Kono Statement, is Japan's acknowledgement of its military's involvement in wartime sexual slavery. And uh, back here in Korea, a huge story that's been making the headlines. An enlisted sergeant who killed five of his fellow soldiers, wounded several others in a shooting rampage last weekend, has now been captured by authorities after a botched suicide attempt. Our Kim Jion has this report. The standoff between the fugitive soldier identified by his surname Im and authorities came to an end on Monday afternoon after 42 hours with an attempted suicide. Authorities say the 22-year-old shot himself in the side with a K2 rifle and has been transported from a military hospital to a private hospital for treatment. The military collected the K2 rifle and ammunition from the fugitive soldier, who is expected to be referred to the military investigative authority so they can determine a motive and cause for the attack. 
He was on the list of soldiers that needed special attention as he struggled adapting to military life. He was deemed unfit for frontline service in a personality test last year, although he retook the test months later and passed. Im killed five of his comrades and injured at least seven others in a grenade and gun attack on Saturday. He later fled to an area some 10 kilometers from the military base where he opened fired on troops before being cornered by the military. The attack is the latest in a series carried out by Korean soldiers. Eight were killed back in 2005 after a soldier went rogue at his military base and a similar incident on Kangwang Island in 2011 left four dead. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Now, another victim has been recovered from the sunken Seolho ferry, bringing the confirmed death toll now from the disaster to 293. Eleven others remain unaccounted for 70 days after the ferry sank in waters off southwestern Korea. Officials say the body is that of a female and she was recovered from the fourth floor of the sunken vessel. The body has been moved to a temporary chapel located in Pengmokhang Harbor. DNA testing will be used for identification as her body uh, has badly decomposed. Divers will resume their search of the ferry once tidal conditions improve. The International Criminal Court has refused to open a probe into whether North Korea should face war crime charges for attacking the South in 2010. The court's chief prosecutor said Monday that there was, quote, no reasonable basis to initiate an investigation into the two deadly incidents that took place in 2010. An artillery attack on Yon Pyongdo Island and the sinking of the South Korean warship Chunan which together killed nearly 50 South Koreans. Both Seoul and an international inquiry blamed the sinking of the warship on a torpedo fired by North Korea. Now, South Korea has been operating a provincial reconstruction team in the war-scarred nation of Afghanistan for roughly four years. But on Monday, its mission came to a close. The group has educated and provided medical assistance to thousands of Afghan citizens. Our Hwang sang filed this report from Afghanistan. Ramad Bibi says she was devastated when doctors in Afghanistan said her heart disease could not be cured. She received surgery at the Korean hospital in Bagram Airfield one month ago and is now waiting to return home. I received medical treatment for one year, but I didn't get better. I'm so happy to have recovered here and I can't wait to see my family. Every day, around 250 Afghans like Ramad visit the Korean hospital in Bagram Airfield. The hospital, one of the Korean provincial reconstruction team's reconstruction projects for Afghanistan, has treated some 150,000 Afghans over the last four years. The vocational training center is another key project of the Korean PRT that has helped change the lives of people like Faisal Safi, a student-turned-teacher at the center's electricity department. My life has completely changed since four or five years that I've been here. Because I'm an electrician, I can get a job very easily to support my family. The Korean PRT, consisting of the government, the military and the private sector, completed its mission in Afghanistan on Monday local time. Since 2010, it has dispatched a total of 2,500 personnel to share Korea's development experience in the fields of health, education, rural development and governance. We are the only aid recipient country to have turned into a donor country. This was clearly demonstrated in Afghanistan. Our activity has given hope to Afghans and became a source of pride for Koreans. And while the PRT era has come to an end, Korea's mission to secure lasting stability in Afghanistan does not end here. The Korean hospital in Bagram Airfield and the Vocational Training Center will remain open to assist those in need as Afghanistan continues its reconstruction efforts. Hwang Sang-hee, Agyang News, Bagram. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News.
to try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine. The European Union also offers 50 billion euros. Now, Korean women have been taking on bigger roles in society here in recent years, but there's new data that suggests there's still a long way to go before there's anything resembling equality. Local information provider Alio has found that only 10% of public sector executives are women. The figure could actually be even lower, considering that some female executives have assumed more than one role at their respective agencies. By ministry, the agencies under the culture ministry had the highest proportion of female board members, but still, that was only 20%. Korea is often regarded as a global leader and role model for so-called e-government, which is the digital age approach to public service. And with that in mind, the country is in, in, inspiring other nations rather to digitise their public services by playing host to the UN's public service award ceremony this week. Kwon Soa has this report. Nearly 1,900 participants from 126 countries are in Korea this week to celebrate Public Service Day at this year's UN Public Service Forum, both of which celebrate the value of public service to the community. I think Korea is the correct place to hold this forum simply because Korea has got tremendous experience in changing from a very poor country to becoming a, an industrialized, developed country. In his keynote speech, Dr. Mahathir praised Korea's public services, especially in the realm of electronic government, which refers to the digital interaction between a government and its citizens. Largely because of its fast-developing IT sector, Korea ranked first in the most two recent UN e-government surveys and is now a role model for other countries. Of course, in Korea, uh, you are uh, ranked top in terms of uh, um, uh, open government and listening to your citizens and, uh, and the systems of uh, open data, uh, e-participation, all of those uh, areas are very important. And uh, we are happy that uh, Korean government are doing very well and trying to learn some of these uh, good practices. A workshop will be held on the second day of the event on Tuesday, one that focuses on innovation and e-governance for sustainable development. The United Nations Public Service Forum is often called the World Cup of Public Service Gatherings, as it is the biggest of its kind. Korea hopes to draw international attention to its services through a successful hosting of the event and extend the so-called Korean wave into the field. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, anyone who's ever been to Korea in the summer will be able to tell you that it is very hot and extremely humid and sticky. But to beat the heat, previous generations of Koreans would wear clothes made of moshi, which is a light and airy traditional fabric. Well, now this fabric is making somewhat of a fashion resurgence, as our Park Ji Won reports. 69-year-old Pang Yeonuk has been weaving mushi or fine raimi fabrics for almost her entire life. The skill she learned dates back to 1500 years to the nation's west central region of Hansan. It takes great effort to make a fabric out of raimi plants as it involves many steps. To make a suit, the weaving process itself takes about 10 days. Moshi cloth weaving starts with the raimi plant, one of the oldest fibers cultivated for fabrics. Raimi first needs to be peeled off and then split to be made into threads. The handmade community process of weaving the fabric made it on UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list in 2011. These handmade raimi fabrics are known for being light, breathable and holding shape easily. This strong yet airy natural fabrics has inspired modern fashion designers like Seo Young Soo, who recently held a collection composed of pieces made of mushi fabric. 
What's great about the Raimi fabric is that it gives a beautiful natural silhouette to any design. It goes especially well with dresses, although it's not too feminine. Moshi can go well with any design, but I think it's the best fabric for high-end dresses. For those who would like to experience the textiles themselves, the annual Hansan Raimi Fabric Cultural Festival is taking place this week in the west central part of the country. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Right, we have some news just coming in. Uh, Korea's Prime Minister-designate Moon Chang-guk has withdrawn from the running. This happened within the last minute or so. This amid criticism, very heavy criticism of his historical views about things such as wartime sex slavery and Japan's occupation of Korea. He becomes the second Prime Minister nominee to step down, in fact, in the space of just a few weeks. Uh, so we'll be bringing you more details on this story, of course, in our next newscast at noon Korea time. Now, we all know the feeling getting into a car that's been sat out in the blazing summer sunshine and we scramble to crank up the AC up to full blast. Well, normally this is the extent of our inconvenience, but safety agencies here in Korea say you should be mindful about what you leave in your car on a hot summer's day. Paulie reports. Hot weather conditions outside can lead to hotter and even dangerous temperatures inside parked automobiles. The temperature of a car interior that measures 30 degrees Celsius in the shade jumps to nearly 50 degrees just after a few minutes in direct sunlight. The temperature on a dashboard can rise even higher to a staggering 90 degrees. While we are fully aware of the heat, we may not be aware of the dangers it poses to items inside our vehicles. A can of soda will explode when the dashboard reaches 78 degrees, while a disposable lighter can blow up at 82 degrees. When sunlight is at its strongest during the day, temperatures in a vehicle tend to rise rapidly. This increases the chances of flammable items catching fire. It's important for drivers to maintain their cars by checking the coolant level and leaving windows slightly open to assure ventilation. Experts also advise drivers to park their cars in the shade if possible. If it's not an option, they say you should create your own shade by covering the windshield and side windows. And since the summer season in Korea coincides with the rainy season, it's recommended that drivers replace their air conditioner filters as conditions are ripe for bacteria to grow. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we continue on with our 2014 Brazil World Cup coverage. Now, of course, starting today, there were four matches that took place, including the two undefeated teams in Group B, the Netherlands and Chile. So let's take a look at the highlights. Of course, taking a look here now, both nations neck and neck throughout the first half of the match as the first half ends in a nil-nil draw. But in the second half, it's La Hoy Fer who strikes in the 77th minute, giving the Dutch the 1-0 lead. 90-plus minute Memphis to pay with the insurance goal here, giving the Netherlands the 2-0 win as the Netherlands finished Group B in first place with three wins. Next up, Spain and Australia both have two losses in Group B e square off earlier today. David Villa scores in the 36th minute, giving Spain the 1-0 lead after the first half. The second half, Fernando Torres and Juan Mata would each score a goal, giving the Spaniards the 3-0 win, finishing Group B e in third place. You on Group A, Brazil and Cameroon facing off. Neymar scores twice in the first half, scoring his third and fourth goal of the tournament, helping Brazil beat Cameroon 4-1 as they advance to the next round. And lastly, Croatia needing a win over Mexico to go through the next round, but Rafael Marquez in the second half scores off of a header, leading to a barrage of Mexican offense after as Mexico qualifies with a 3-1 win. And now moving over to the South Korean national football team, where after losing to Algeria 4-2 in their second group stage match, things have gone harder for them to qualify for the next round. So how can they actually advance? Well, taking a look at here, Group H standing so far, Belgium already in thanks to their two wins so far in Group H, but Algeria is in second place with one win and one loss with a goal difference of plus one. That means in the next final group stage match, Russia needs to beat Algeria by a one goal difference, meaning both nations will be at four points with a goal difference of zero. 
Meanwhile, Korea will need to beat Belgium by three goals or more so that they may advance to with four points with a goal difference of plus one. And as New York Times have calculated, Korea now has a 5% chance of advancing to the next round. Well, Algeria was certainly a surprise team this World Cup, but Costa Rica, who has already beaten teams like Uruguay and Italy, has been the biggest surprise. But not so happy after seven of their players were tested for doping. As the FIFA is suspicious over the recent success of Costa Rica, seven of the players were tested for doping despite just two players normally being tested per team. According to the Associated Press, the president of the Costa Rican Football Association asked FIFA why just their players were tested after their 1-0 win over Italy. Now, FIFA answered back, stating that eight of the players on the team did not take a test prior to the World Cup, hence the number of players tested. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning to you, Eunice. Hello, Mark. So, uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in Iraq, and he's pledged, quote, intense and sustained support for the country that's being absolutely ripped apart by militants. He did, but he also warned of a, quote, existential crisis and urged leaders to act quickly to create a new government that includes those from all political and religious factions. Now, Kerry met with Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki as well as key Shia and Sunni figures and emphasized that the future of Iraq depends on decisions made in the next days and weeks. Kerry also said Prime Minister Maliki reaffirmed his commitment to forming a new, more inclusive government by July 1st. This as insurgents have captured all of the border crossings to Syria and Jordan and a key airport in Tal Afar, as well as, uh, the, as, well as a, a report saying that it has captured the largest oil field in Iraq. Um, and... Uh, also in Iraq, the Daily Mail reports the judge that sentenced former leader Saddam Hussein to death was captured and killed by ISIL militants early last week. As retribution, the Iraqi government has yet to confirm that report. Three Al Jazeera journalists who had been on trial for allegedly supporting the now-banned Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt have been given jail terms of several years, sparking an international outcry. On Monday, an Egyptian court convicted them of spreading false news and aiding a terrorist organization, handing down sentences of seven years against Australian Peter Greist and Canadian Egyptian bureau chief Mohamed Fami. Egyptian producer Bar Mohammed was given 10 years. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry called the sentences chilling and draconian and urged President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, whom he had met one day before, to quickly address the international concerns for freedom of expression. All three have denied the charges and could appeal. Heavy rains have triggered widespread flooding in dozens of cities in southern China, killing at least 26 people and affecting some 3 million others. Yunnan and Hunan provinces were some of the worst hit, forcing hundreds of thousands of people to relocate. Guangxi province received a month's worth of rain in just 24 hours. Hunan province alone saw some 123,000 hectares of crops damaged, hurting agricultural output. Total economic losses are estimated to be around 650 million U.S. dollars. Faulty airbags are being blamed in Monday's recall of some 2.9 million vehicles by three Japanese car makers. Honda, Nissan and Mazda had all used airbags supplied by Tokyo-based Takata Corporation and now concerns that the inflators could cause the airbags to rupture triggered the massive callback. 
They follow an earlier recall by Toyota on June 11th of 2.3 million vehicles equipped with Takata airbags. The U.S. auto safety regulator is investigating the suspected defect. And that's all we have for now. We'll have more updates on uh, the Prime Minister nominee Moon Chang-guk withdrawing his nomination coming up at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.